Hello, my name is Francis Meadow. I have no mirrors. And welcome to Comedy on the Edge. We have a veritable plethora of guests, some of whom are so memorable that I have to read their name in this sheet. Let's see, we have Phil Berliner, Dan Savage, Willie Savage, Samantha Savage, and Louise Goldstein as part of our introductory roster. And we also have a special audience member, Hooray! Like I said, I'm Francis Domeno, and I'm actually performing in my civvies just this once. Maybe I should tell you a little bit about my hobbies. 1957, drooling. 1967, uh, melting army soldiers over ants. I don't like to admit this, but I feel comfortable with you. Actually, I didn't do it. Some other kid did it, and my mother saw him one day and said, I don't want you hanging out with him. She didn't know, but she knew. I don't like that boy. I don't want you hanging out with him. You'll get that a lot, you know, really. I don't like that boy. I don't want you hanging out with him. Let's see, 1977, getting stoned. 1987, getting drunk. And now, 1993, my hobby is drooling. <laughs> Somehow, you always come back to the basics. I'd like to share a few of my hard bits of philosophy. A socialist is a hobo with a PhD. The moon is a giant ovary. That's why we shoot rockets at it. Ebbing water is naive water spelled backwards. Grade school is a hospital where sometimes they amputate your imagination by mistake. Rock and roll is capitalism in one, four, five. Consume, 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 consume. Fornicate, fornicate. Die, 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 die. Business is the religion of selfishness. Churches are mausoleums of faith. Politics? is sports for people who are too fat to run. Academia is a grave and a shallow one. Multinationals are armies with a credit line. A factory is a shrine, and chances are the man who runs it is a shriner. TV is autism in a box. Now you ask me, well, what do you like? Damn you. Well, I'll tell you what I like. I like to go to Weight Watchers meetings and leave chocolate-flavored farts in the vestibule. <laughs> Whenever I see a parrot that says, Polly want a cracker, I say, Polly also wants a lesson in remedial grammar, doesn't he? I believe that inside of every thin woman, there's a fat man struggling to get out. Me. I believe that we should build heartless shelters where heartless people can go to hide from the homeless. I believe that my house was built over the site of an Indian burial ground. How do I know this? Mm, maybe it was the flint arrowheads. Maybe it was the bronze pewter mugs. Or maybe it was the peyote buttons in the shape of bingo markers that tipped me off. I don't know. My dad said, son, if you work at a restaurant, you'll always eat. I said, dad, what if I work in a coffee house? Will I always be nervous? A lot of comedy clubs around town have their logo, which reads, Boston's Brightest Young Comedians. Boston's Brightest Young Comedians. Well, I don't want that. I want to go see stupid old comedians. I want to see comedians who are actually gigantic gorillas who throw things, laugh or a throat chair. I want to see caveman comedians. Me, hit a woman on head with club, pull her by hair. That's the 
kind of comedy I like. But no, I guess we're stuck with Boston's brightest comedians, young or old. I have a couple of bumper stickers on my car. One of them says, ask me about my eternal torment. And the other one says, honk if you've betrayed our Lord. It's not polite to burp on stage. Okay, here's the ground rules for our new show, which is called Comedy on the Edge. No opium smoking in the bathroom. That's about it. That's all I can think of right now. Because, you know, it leaves a smell. It's hard to get out. The police don't like it. You know, I mean, I, I hate to tell people, you can't do racial jokes, you can't do ethnic jokes, you can't do sexist jokes, because, you know, I'm against all those things, but the spirit of humor is the spirit of taboo breaking. And if you're doing it in a way which is insightful and meaningful, then I hate you because you're better than me. There's a big conflict now, I think, between the old baby boomers, the young baby boomers, and the baby busters. Because, you know, the old boomers are smug because they get to run things now. That's anybody who remembers the Kennedy assassination. That's an old boomer. A young boomer is anybody who was in junior high school when Nixon was impeached. And a buster, well, the first memory of a baby buster is when the Minutemen broke up. Oh, what a tragedy! I don't want to get up, Ma. Why is that? The Minutemen broke up. Well, what about fire hose? Yeah, fire hose! I'll go see them instead! That's great! Thanks, Mom! You saved today! Well, we want Comedy on the Edge to be a platform for old boomers, young boomers, and baby busters, generation Xers, call them what you will. We can have someone who's 76 years old, we can have someone who's 7 years old. Because our motto, and it's one that you might do well remember, is We just don't care! Have fun! Welcome! Comedy on the Edge! Our first guest is from Cambridge, which is appropriate. And his name, where in Cambridge are you from, Mr. Savage? Uh, East Cambridge. East Cambridge. Okay. So he's an Eastern Bloc Canterbridgean. Let's give him a big hand. Mr. Dan Savage.
I hope you're having fun. This is not a lyric, this is a sketch for a lyric. Post. The first one, it's a placeholder for the first character, to be named. The second one, another placeholder, to be named, said, I hope you're having fun, because it rhymes with the placeholder name. But this is not a lyric, this is a sketch. Get it together, Paul. Um, someday I'll finish up that bit, but anyway. Um, I was thinking about a uh, phrase I saw. I saw this thing on MTV, and it flashed up, and it said, those who do not remember the past are doomed to... Those who do not remember the past... Those who do not remember... Those. Okay. Scratch that. <laughs> what about... There we go. Scratch that. Did you ever notice, you listen to classical music, they tell you more than you really need to know? Right. That was Beethoven's Sonata Number no. 7 in C minor. Do we really need to know what key it was? What, like, as opposed to Sonata Number no. 7 in D minor or E minor? I, what's the difference? I mean, it's only going to be played in one key, that's how it's written. I'm not playing it, folks. I'm listening to the song. I don't care. Uh, this is not important to me. Well, how was the concert the other night? Oh, it was it really sucked, man. They they played the Sonata Number no. Seven, but they played it in E minor. E minor? Oh no, it's supposed to be played in C minor. Oh yeah, they were much better before the violinist died too. What's what's what's, what's going on? Can you just imagine if they did this to popular music, right? And now, Mr. Edward Van Halen performing on lead Stratocaster guitar, playing Jump in A major. <laughs> That's got possibilities. Uh, frightening thing, I saw a trailer for a movie coming. You know, they always show you movies coming out way in advance. Movie coming out this Christmas. From the producers of Amadeus. The story of Johann Sebastian Bach. Starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Do, 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 do. Come see me this Christmas. Because I'll be Bach. Do, 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 do. <laughs> It's a silly little one. Um, I'm just trying to link a classical theme there. Uh, here's, here's a term that never made any sense to me, time management. Um, look, as I understand it, time is a pretty constant thing in our universe, on our plane. If the sun comes up, goes down, 24 hours in a day, pretty constant thing. I don't think it really needs any management, folks. I think it's doing pretty well all by itself. I mean, people are in the business of time management. How does this work? Hey, Bill, how's that 25-hour day coming? Oh, just great, Joe, and you know, we'll have that eight-day week package and ready to ship soon. Okay. Ever notice, I'm not in it, I haven't been in a relationship for years, folks. And uh, one of the things about not being in a relationship is that you notice things and you see things differently. Like when somebody, there's a point at which you get really serious with somebody and you're obligated to tell them that you love them constantly. And you know when this is? Just before you say goodbye. How did this start? Yes, honey, I, I love you. Goodbye. And of course, when they say that, you have to shoot right back with them. I love you, too. It's kind of tricky sometimes when you're with the guys, you know? Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. You say goodbye. But what is this about just before you say goodbye? How would I... If I got in a relationship with somebody and got to that point, would I have to leave a special message on my machine? Thank you for calling, and uh, Angela, if that's you, I love you. Goodbye. Yeah. When, since when did this become mandatory? Can you just imagine if you did it? It's a reflex to say, yeah, I love you too. How would it work if you did it when it wasn't expected? Uh, Joe, okay, you're going to drop those tires off on Friday? Yeah, 12 dozen of them. Great deals. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll see you then. I love you. Goodbye. <laughs> and what would you do if he answered back, I love you too. <laughs> See you then. Uh, Julia Roberts has gotten married a while, love it. Okay. Is there something wrong with this picture, folks? I mean, I look at this, I think of that, that Joe Jackson song, you know, is, is she really going out with him? I know. I'll tell you though, it gives me it gives me hope. I feel so good. There's there's hope for us ordinary and not so great looking guys. Okay, that's that's what it does for me. Uh, I'm writing a letter to Gina Davis right now. Uh, dear Gina, I close as a picture as you can see. I, I'm sort of ordinary looking. And uh, what do you think we get married next Tuesday? Okay, 
Uh, the setup was all wrong. He's supposed to tell you that they got married supposedly three weeks after they met. Okay? Given that, uh, I can pose a picture. When do you say we get married next Tuesday? I hope that's soon enough for you. By the way, if you don't think I'm unattractive enough, I'd be happy to slam my face in a car door a couple of times. No problem. Um, Pele. Pele is, you know, the soccer player. Hasn't played for 10 years. He has now found his calling, folks, as a healer. Pele as a healer. Of course, you know he's not a hands-on healer because he's a soccer player, right? Oh, is your back feeling better now? I don't use my hands. Yes, this is wonderful. All right. My impression of Pele bringing up his children, teaching up, teaching them manners at the dinner table. All right, children, now pass the chicken. Very good, very good. Pass the peas. Yes, yes, yes. And finally, <laughs> in the series, Pele teaching manners to his children. Now, when you meet somebody, you shake the hand. Shake the hand. Very good. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm almost out of stuff. Oh, 900 numbers. This is something I find that's amazing. You know, just 10 years ago, you would have been arrested for something you paid $3.95 a minute for now. Yeah, technology is, is really neat, these 900 numbers. Uh, let's see. There was a 900 number I saw advertised. Uh, you can get an IQ test for $3.95 a minute. Was this a problem? Do people really need the results? Hello, Mensa, I've got the results from my IQ test. Yes, right here, yeah, 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 right here. I could dialed it up and I got it. I had to call 10 times to get the score, but here we go. $3.95 a minute, average call, 10 minutes, that's about $40. Folks, if you're thinking about dialing this number, send me $20, I'll give you a ballpark figure, real fast, okay? We'll start at about 80 and work our way down. All right, here's another 900 number. This is, I can't make these ones up. You can send a message into space for 350. <laughs> send a message into space. <laughs> I mean, what do you say? Aliens suck. <laughs> Earth rules. <laughs> what's, what's this about? Can you imagine, like, you send that off, and three light years later, you know, you get a phone call. Earthlings suck. Aliens rule. <laughs> We didn't pay 350 a minute for this, you fool. Um, have fun, Bill. <laughs> the uh, and the final in the 900 number series is um, you can have a personal 800 number. Why not have a personal 900 number for those people you really don't want to talk to? Hey, mom, how you doing? Yeah, no, we can talk all day. Yeah, 395 a minute. Sure. <laughs> What are you wearing, Mom? <laughs> totally tasteless. And uh, let's see. Uh, fashion, I want to talk about uh, bell-bottom jeans, platform shoes, tie-dye shirts. They say it's a fashion comeback. No, no, no. It's an acid flashback. It's what it is. Okay, I took some really powerful shit 25 years ago, and it's just kicking in now. I'm going to have to have a talk with my son about drugs. And this is going to be a really tough conversation, okay? Because I'm going to sound just like my father. I'm going to say, son, you can't, you, you, you can't do drugs because they don't make drugs like they used to. No, they don't. And I'm going to sound just like my father saying something like that, aren't I? No, but they have this stuff now. Ecstasy, $50 a hit. $50 for this designer drug. It's like a Bill Blast, Calvin Klein kind of feel good, morning thing. It lasts six to eight hours. Six to eight hours? Fifty dollars? Look, when I was a kid, I wouldn't pay, there I go sounding like my father again, when I was a kid, I wouldn't pay more than five dollars for a four-way tab of sunshine, okay? It would last 24 to 48 hours, all right? I would wake up an entirely different person. I might have had a sex change. I would wake up in another state. I might have shaved my head, grown a toe. Completely different person from that point on. All for a dollar twenty-five. For fifty dollars, $50, I want a reservation, okay? I want a limo to deliver this stuff. I want six of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. I want to have the best sex I've ever had. I want to wake up with hair on my head, okay? You didn't have to laugh at that one. Okay, so the way I find out about this is my friend Bill. He take me. Bill is not what you call a highly developed person. He's your basic beer-guzzling, womanizing, homophobic lawn cutter is what he is. And uh, he meets this woman, convinces him to buy this stuff ecstasy. He spends like three unemployment checks on it, okay? Loses track of her, claims she turned into like a puff of smoke. 
shows up at my door at like three in the morning and is saying things, you know, you won't shut up, right? Hey, Dan, did I ever tell you you got beautiful eyes, man? <laughs> come here, give me a hug. You want to take a shower? Hey, come here, I want to have your children, man. I love you. Goodbye. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else that I should do here before I get out of here? Um, bomb builders. You know that a couple of weeks ago down in New York, they, they busted some terrorists uh, building bombs, nine guys building bombs. I was thinking that's an interesting occupation, being a bomb builder. I mean, how does the job interview go? Okay, Mr. X. We see, uh, what are your, exactly are your qualifications? Well, for one thing, I have most of my fingers. Can't say that a lot, a lot of my contemporaries. In fact, a lot of my classmates never made it past finals in school. I see, and uh, what have you done exactly? You remember the sequential serial bombings, the Pan Am bombings. Flight 723, 724, and 726. Uh, yeah, what happened to 725? Well, technically that wasn't ours. The engine <laughs> fell off all by itself but we did get credited for an assist. I see. And anything else? Uh, plane bombings are sort of ordinary these days. Uh, yes, remember Mount St. Helens? <laughs> that was mine. I thought that was a volcano. I'm really good at covering my tracks. Um, so that's all new stuff, and uh, I think some of it will work. Um, so I should probably like... Thanks. Good. Good. Um, let me just think of something quick I can do that really works. Should I do something about the kid? Okay, my father. My father's like a new man, married woman, who's like 25 years younger than me. Okay, he's full of advice now. Guys, guys, oh, it never ceases to amaze me. You know, guys go, yeah, 25 years younger than me. It's like a new man. And he's full of advice for me about my love life. Like, I need this, right? Yeah. Thanks, Dad. It's just what I thought would happen. You know, this is how it would turn out. He said, son, I just want you to find a woman like I did and be happy like I am. I said, dad, if I found a woman like you, I'd be in jail. And she'd be 13. Anyway, <laughs> let me turn this back over to Francis, and uh, let's keep it rolling. This floor is filthy. I don't want to get my shirt dirty, so I'm not going to roll it. So I can't keep it rolling. That's right, it's the Steve Allen, interpret every comment literally brand of humor. Nice day out today, isn't it? Well, technically speaking, nice also means sharp. If you tend to signify that the day is actually sharp, I think you're inaccurate and not and guilty of a misnomer. People are standing out there watching that building being destroyed outside. They've been gawking at it for 45 minutes. I think it's the flashback syndrome you were mentioning earlier. But and I saw some kids out there trying to turn the channel, you know, like, what's going on? I don't want to watch this building anymore. I want to watch one being put up. Put, put the tape on backwards and watch. That's what I should have done. I should have videotaped that building burning down and then, you know, rewound it on, you know, and then I could have yeah. Hey, anatomy of a fire being sucked out of a building. <laughs> that would be cool. In fact, you could do that with a lot of movies, like uh, Batman, for example. Um, the Joker flies 5,000 feet up in the air, lands on a parapet, takes a sword away from Batman, and 20 years earlier, he sucks a bullet out of Batman's father. And Batman's happy. The end. You can do that with history, for that matter. Hey, you know, Mount St. Helena sucks all that smoke back in. John Hinckley sucks a bullet out of Ronald Reagan's lung. Lee Harvey Oswald, standing up in the Texas Book Depository. It's a miracle! All those bombs come flying out of Dresden, back up into the B-52s. That fellow that shot the Archduke Ferdinand, that bullet gets sucked right back into the rifle! Oh, and you just go back and back and back and back. You know, um, Slaves have their freedom taken away from them, plane chains, shipped to Africa, their tribesmen. I can't, I can't, it's too mind-boggling, I can't, I can't keep it up anymore. So, 
I think instead I'm going to introduce our next guest, which I guess would be Mr. Phil Berliner. Hey. The dog is not by the way, none of this would be taking place. Phil Berliner. Big band jazz, and then there was bebop, and all the big band jazz people said, I hate bebop, and then there was John Coltrane, and then free jazz, and all the bebop people said, I hate free jazz. Well, Phil Bruner is like free jazz, and he's great. Let's hear it for him. Phil Bruner. Our next guest. Raise your hand. Her name is Louise Goldstein. Too many calls from strangers, so. 
I'll tell you the truth, I get nervous talking in front of people and um, I read somewhere the best thing to do when you're nervous is to breathe deeply through your diaphragm. But I'm supposed to leave it in for six hours after you. Um, it's not going to work. I know, I know. Um, sometimes I pretend I'm somebody else and it helps me get through. So what I'm going to do is a commercial for you that I saw on the Biblical Home Shopping Network. Get out your Master of the Universe card and save, save, save. Join as well. The sale is going on now. Spiritual values on these divine products and services. Adam and Eve's barbecued ribs. Cain and Abel's guide to overcoming sibling rivalry. David's self-defense for the little guy. Elijah's profit sharing manual. Jesus' guide to a stable childhood. King Solomon's very wise potato chips. Lot's wife's low salt cookbook. Mary's fertility planner and pregnancy guide. Noah's blood insurance. Act before Lent and receive absolutely free of charge. Mayor Flynn's Pope on a rope soap. So call 1 800 Pearly G. That's 1 800 Pearly G. Angels are flying by to take your call. I grew up in Long Island, New York. I don't know if anyone's been there. Um, I was raised on a sweet and low plantation. I remember looking at the pink packets glistening in the sunlight. <laughs> and uh, I'd get up at the crack of dawn, go to the red aluminum sided barn, and we kept our plastic cows in there. We had the kind you see at Ben and Jerry's, and the kind you see at the Hilltop Steakhouse. I'd squeeze their udders. They produce marvelous cremora. It's the best. <laughs> then on the way home, I'd go through the wax fruit orchard, the canned vegetable garden, back home, and things were depressing when I was a child. Even the pillows were down. By the time we brought the glad bags home, they were depressed. It was awful. I, I had a Klaus Barbie doll. It was. I had a gay Ken doll. He came in a closet. Oh, it's amazing he came at all. Um, <clears throat> my erector set was infinite. My Mickey Mouse watch had a nervous tick. You know, my dad, God love him, he was always trying to save a buck. I had to wear generic clothing, like my dresses would just be white with dress and capital black letters across the front. You know. And, we had a pay phone in the house. No incoming calls. It was difficult. I reached puberty and I had to wear one of those training bras. Training bra. What's what kind of training is going on here? I mean, is there like a subliminal tape inside the cups? Oh, we must, we must, we must continue the bus. Naturally, my father put in a tampon dispenser to mark the occasion. My parents had a great sex life. They did. One night, my mother was on top, and my father, my mother, my father, my mother, they loved their bunk beds. Loved them. My father gave to charity, and she in turn promised not to tell about their affair. My mother got her affair catered. Way to go, Mom. So. I wasn't the most popular kid. I, I wasn't really like a social butterfly. I was more like a moth, actually. I smoked uncool cigarettes growing up. It was, <laughs> and I wasn't that coordinated. Like, I tried to do a cartwheel, and it would look more like a train wreck, you know? And I, so I wasn't a cheerleader. I made this loser cheerleader team, you know? We did this bizarre kick line thing. We'd get into reaction formation and kick ourselves for everything we'd ever done wrong in life. You know, that was kind of... <laughs> And family vacations, forget it. We stayed at this budget motel, the Motel Depressive. We'll leave the oven door open for you. It was just, ugh. so I'm in therapy naturally, and my doctor is a strict Freudian, and I never believed in that Freudian slip business until I saw them on the cell rack at Philene's basement. Now I'm thinking, maybe there's something to it. And I've gotten in touch with my wounded inner child, so now I have to pay for both of us at each session, which I can't stand. And I'm a sucker for some of these new products that are out, these new age groovy things, holistic products. Like I have that Serene Wrap, helps keep your food calm. <laughs> Love that stuff. Reincarnation, instant breakfast, good for all your lifetimes. 
I have a holistic car with a V8 engine. We're talking vegetable juice here, folks. The only exhaust is mine, trying to keep up with the payments. And even the new agers, though, they can rip you off. Like the last seminar I went to, I got a used mantra. It was premeditated. <laughs> I have an active fantasy life. Sometimes I, I imagine like myself as a famous singer, but how would it go really? I mean, what would I be like? Madonna Goldstein? It doesn't, doesn't have the right ring to it. What would I sing like? Circumcise. There's gonna be a circumcision. It doesn't, doesn't really work, so I'm gonna give that up. I read self-help books like Feel the Fear and Stay in Bed. And the one that inspired me to get up on stage was do what you love, the predators will follow. Or that wonderful holistic book, Finding the Green Goddess Within Your Refrigerator, great book. That's about my time, just gonna leave you with a driving tip. Driving in Boston is so awful, isn't it? I mean, people just cut you off all the time. Do what I did, get one of those cutesy onboard things for the back of your car. car. Mine says, psychopath on board. People don't know if I'm kidding or not, and they stay away from me. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Back to your host. Gee, that's funny. You know, I got a bumper sticker because uh, you know, it's right near MIT. It says, "I break for the Starship Enterprise. Caution: nuclear reactor on board. I break for unicellular life." Ask me about Heisenberg's theory of, I forget. Uh, see, I'm not that smart. What is it you know? Heisenberg's theory of uncertainty. I wasn't too certain that I knew that, but now I know that I know. But do you know that I know that I know? Ah, well, our next guest is in fact the youngest male comedian in Boston. It's the start of a whole new generation. Can we have like a chorus line? It's a whole new generation. And um, his name, Mr. William Savage Esquire.
She says, what time is it? He says, I'm trying to get closer to my bag. He says, are you being fresh with me? He says, fresh, fresh, very fresh. He says, shall I punch you in the face? And then he says, hurry up before someone else does. By the way, this happens at the Middle East every Saturday from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Middle East at 472 Massachusetts Avenue, Central Square, Cambridge, and it's free, it's free. And all the comedy clubs are closing down. Ha, 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 so we're going to get all the comedians in here. Ha, ha. So remember, Middle East, Saturday, 2 to 3.30 p.m. So come on down, and we'll be right back. wacky surprises on the second episode of Comedy on the Edge. You never know when you want to be in the crowd talking and all of a sudden you get a microphone thrust in you. <laughs> U.S. won't cut and run. Any ideas? I'm putting you on the spot. No, we'll just run. Forget the cutting part, you know. We'll just double our troops. We had 276, they weren't doing shit. Let's have 576 and they'll get killed twice as fast. Yay, Somalia, let's go. Well, what's the, you know, Desert Storm, they had a big name. What are they going to call Somalia? Operation Feed Him and Get the Fuck Out of There or what? What are they going to call it? I don't know. This isn't written material, so don't expect much. In fact, don't expect anything. In fact, why do I even bother? In fact, I'm going home now. I'm going to take my ball and go home. And take both of them and go home. Uh, well, today we have Ron Berman. Dean Lynch, and my oldest friend, Joe Berliner. Who wants to go first? <laughs> They're all pointing. You know, who volunteers? Step, they take one step forward. Uh, Phil. Phil. OK, Phil, I'm afraid you're going to be the fall guy, the patsy, see? We're going to set you up. Well, anyway, here he is once more. The Dean of Satire and Mimicry, Mr. Bill Berliner. It's the Roman numeral two. Earlier this year, the company I work for hired the lovely Cappuccino sisters, Caterina and Natalia, damn fine workers and America's foremost country in Western Korea. two voices in pristine harmony singing Stand By Your Agency. So I ran to the room closet where I discovered a microwave radio transmitter and 
a receipt from a Motel 6 in Langley, Virginia. At that very moment, I realized the shocking truth. The Cappuccino sisters were government operatives. <gasps> I confronted them with my suspicions. Katerina remained silent. Kind of like you people. <laughs> Natalia issued a formal denial. Oh no, I'm not a government operative. No, 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 no. I'm not a government operative. No. 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 Me thinks the lady thought protest too much. She couldn't fool me. I knew she was more than just another tentress, more than some Microsoft Matahari. She was a super astro vixen. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. So I did what any loyal American would do. I called Oliver Stone. Of course, he purchased the film rights. I'm very happy to announce that production is set to begin shortly on the movie. Casting for the role of Bill Berliner has been narrowed down to two candidates, Beverly Hills 90210 star Jason Priestley and Sparky the Wonder Horse. And you want to know a secret? Don't tell anybody. I'm pulling for Sparky. Thank you, good night! Phil Berliner. Polysyllabic euphemism. The greatest ever. I guess. <laughs> well, uh, gee, that narrows us down to two candidates, uh, Sparky and, um, is it uh, Dean Lynch? No. Ron Berman. Well, I'm pulling for Ron Berman. Ber Ber I'm pulling for Ron Berman! And here he is, Ron Berman. <laughs> and I've never followed a uh, Marvel's book character before, so. Excuse me. This is, uh, this is pretty weird. Uh, I feel like I'm like in a Fellini film or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, I, I think I'm going to get punished for doing this. I mean, I'm Jewish, and this is the Sabbath, and I'm in a Middle Eastern restaurant. <laughs> so. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Yasa says it's okay, so. <laughs> um, I just want to start off by saying, Oh, Hanukkah, oh, Hanukkah, like my menorah. <laughs> you know, actually, Hanukkah is my favorite, fa it's my favorite Jewish holiday because you get presents for eight days. You know, and I used to really tease the uh, Gentile boys and girls, because they'd, they'd always be, hey, Jew boy, with the Yamaha on your head, you don't celebrate Christmas, you don't celebrate Christmas. Santa doesn't go to your house, Santa doesn't go to your house. And I'd be like, oh, yeah? I celebrate something better. I celebrate Hanukkah. I get presents for eight days. I get presents for eight days. You only get presents for one day. That's all Santa can afford to bring because the Jews own everything else. Your parents work for Jews. We own you. We are the chosen people. We are the chosen people. <laughs> I wonder if they realize I'm the chosen people. <laughs> Excuse me, can I have another bottle of the noosh? Um, but you know, I would never dare, I would never dare tell them that my presence actually, my presence actually consisted of, uh, 
chocolate coins, socks, slacks, underwear, and occasionally a new tallis. <laughs> you, know, you know what amazes me is uh, by the eighth night of Hanukkah, the house is flooded with candles. And I always had this weird thing that Liberace is going to come crashing through the front door wailing on a piano. But I guess that's just me. <laughs> you know, speaking of Hanukkah, I, uh, I, just, I went to the Grateful Dead concert at uh, the Boston Garden a couple weeks ago. You can always tell the dead are in town because the homeless population doubles. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really weird because uh, sitting, right, sitting directly to my left were these two old ladies in their mid-80s. They had to be at least 85. Right? They, were really, they were deadheads. And as soon as the lights went down for the, for the concert, all you could hear was this giant sucking sound. It was like, everybody's lighting up. And I could smell at least 50 different blends of weed being lit. Right? So just keep that thought. So as soon as the lights go down, you smell all this weed. There's a giant mushroom cloud forming. <laughs> right? And the band, the, the dead come out and they start jamming. I look over to my left to the old ladies and they're going, oh, 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 oh. Wigs are flying everywhere, right? <laughs> Freak me out. Three girls in front of me are these three young girls, completely stoned, right? And they start going, woo! Woo! Right? They're showing their tits. I look back over at the old ladies and they're going, Woo! 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 Jerry, I want your grandchildren! <laughs> the sad thing was, I was getting turned on. It's, it's the weed. It's a sexual stimulant. Right? <laughs> oh, man. So, they, they're, they're showing their chest. And I don't think i the rest of the joke. It might be on this wall. <laughs> People on drugs. There it is. <laughs> so, right, um, what the fuck is the rest of that joke? This is so weird. I, I, yeah, I really feel like I need to be an LSD to fit into this. In this. Um, so, that was the dead concert. I'm going to do some more Jewish show just because this is an Arab restaurant. <laughs> Phil likes it. Phil, you Jewish? Of course. All right, it's a Jewish crowd. How many other people are Jewish here? Honorary. Honorary, that's all right. You're uh -huh. circumcised. Uh -huh. You know what? <laughs> I, I, I gotta tell you this. Um, I, I have come across a magnificent Jewish classic film that, that I, I really want to share with you because, because it's very special to my heart. Um, this film, this film even rivals Fiddler on the Roof. Does everybody remember Fiddler? I wish I was a rich man. Everyone! I eat a yitty 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 yum. All day long I eat a yitty bum. Arabs! Yitty 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 yum. You remember? Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Catch me a catch. Everyone! Find me a fine. Well, you know what I'm talking about? This, this, I want to I wanna break the suspense. The film is a... Uh, the film is called, you might have seen it. Remember, remember the film Apocalypse Now? Right? Remember at the end of the film when Brando says those three infamous Yiddish words? The horror. The horror. The horror. Da 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 Hey! Da 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 Bring on the belly dancing girls! Da 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 I had like 20 minutes, but I don't know if I'm going to do 20 minutes. <laughs> um, let, me, let, just, let, me, let me make it short because there's, uh, there's a lot of comics here tonight, and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to get on. Uh, let me see. You know, I, I just want to talk about, because, you know, I haven't noticed, the moon symbolizes capitalism to me, because it's, it's white. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, 
You know, I don't wanna I don't wanna upset anybody. I don't mean to think like this. I don't wanna offend anybody. But how how do blind people know when they're done wiping their ass? How do they know? Because when I wipe my ass, I gotta look. You just can't sit there all day gauging your wipes. You gotta know, you gotta life it. I mean when I wipe my ass, it's hey, I'm not even halfway done. How do you know? I mean that's all we do is wipe off and look. Wipe off and look. Wipe off and look. Sounds like a Karate Kid movie, doesn't it? Yeah. Dinosaur! I am to do what I have to do. And, uh... <laughs> let, me, let me finish off on, uh... Something that gets a chuckle. How about the... Want to stick with the Jewish shows? Alright. Uh, let's stick with the Jewish shows. Uh, the Jews have a homeland, the Palisades don't. No, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> the Jews find it funny. Uh, how about another Jewish joke? 1960s, the 67 war only took three days. Thank you. <laughs> I like that one. Um, how about some more Jewish jokes? Um, we have all of Jerusalem? Um, um, Hi. <laughs> oh, man, I think I'm going to get like a sh one of those beef shababs right through my heart when I walk out. <laughs> get the Jew! But Yasa said we have to make peace. Peace in the Middle East. Yasa. Um, what else? Um, let me see. Oh, here's something Jewish. You know what? So I'm sure you can relate to this. Um, my Bobby, that's uh, grandma for everyone else. At, you know, every time I'd go over to my Bobby's house, she, she, she would always make me eat. I, I remember I went over last weekend just, just to visit, say hello, she had a naughty page. I walk in, she goes, Oi, my little Tantalo, the shade of Punam. Uh, she has this huge meal prepared for me, massive meal, everything. Lux, bagels, brisket, and I'm like, sorry, Bobby, I, I just ate, I'm not hungry, I just came to visit. Rami, what? You don't like my cooking? I made it just for you. Please, I, I ate, I'm trying to wash my weight. Rami, you're my only grandchild. I do it for you, I love you. So I end up giving in. I say, all right, all right, I'll have it. She gives me hugs and kisses. I have this huge meal. I I'm stuffed beyond belief. And then she pulls me aside and says, you know, Ronnie, you're putting on a little weight. So that sums up my life. <laughs> Thank you very much. A traditional MC handshake with the party media, Ron Berman. Ron Berman is now leaving the vicinity. Ron Berman is sitting down. We are tracking Ron Berman as he talks to Joe Berliner. And now, we are preparing for the arrival of none other than the explosive, spectacular Dean Lynch. How is Dean going to face performing in front of a camera which may eventually end up on cable access and reach, oh, perhaps 50 people, perhaps 500, perhaps 5,000, perhaps 50,000, or perhaps five? Well, we'll see, guys. Dean Lynch takes the stage. Dean Lynch. Fuck television. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, I was watching that film last night, uh, Give Me Shelter, where Rolling Stones at Altamont and uh, Mick Jagger comes out and there's Hell's Angels beating their shit out of people with fucking guns and knives. Mick comes out with a, a silk scarf tied around his neck and makeup and he's trying to stop it. Yeah, you got a good shot, Mick. So yeah, I'm not from uh, I'm not from around here. I'm from Texas. <laughs> no, I'm from England. Uh, country to go to the world might be Thatcher, who um, has just had a sex change operation, and uh, she's now a woman. We also gave the world the Beatles. Do you remember the Beatles? Yeah. You must remember you shot one of them. We give you the Beatles, you shoot one of them, and give us new kids on the block. Yeah. <laughs> what a country.
So I've been living in America for five years and um, learned a lot of things, you know. Uh, like, you know, in America you call us limeys and we call you loud mouth, obnoxious, warmongering bastards. And um, you call condoms rubbers and we call you loud mouth, obnoxious, warmongering bastards. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, uh, part of my culture, because I was born in England, but I'm in fact Irish. Um, my father said he came to England during the potato famine. He said there was uh, plenty of other food in Ireland, but he wouldn't touch it without the potatoes. And um, the part of our culture is we like to drink. You know, it's a great fucking culture. And uh, I'm getting pretty sick and tired of people in America claiming to be alcoholics, you know, when they drink something like a bottle of wine a month. Because you know, I think you should have to prove you're an alcoholic in order to get into Alcoholics Anonymous. Someone like Kitty Dukakis, like she proved that she was an alcoholic because when she couldn't get any alcohol, she would drink stuff like um, nail polish remover and uh, mouthwash for the alcohol content. Now, uh, what was wrong with that? Did no one, anyone ever tell her you should never mix your drinks? <laughs> Just for uh, some showbiz news. Uh, Axel, Axel Rose is um, taking his um, ex-girlfriend to court, claiming um, mental and uh, physical abuse. What a fucking wuss. Next you'll hear that uh, Slash is taking his girlfriend to court because uh, she says he looks a dickhead in that big fucking hat. And there's a... Uh, this commercial, see I don't like television. I really don't like it, uh, especially that show of the Wonder Years, because like, how does that guy remember all that shit? You know, I don't remember what happened last week. And you never see him jerking up, do you? You know, you never hear him saying things like, I remember back in 1967, I was banking a lot then. <laughs> what else have we got? We've got uh, commercials, yeah. Commercials drive me crazy. You've got, um, this one for Kellogg's Muesli, where like you've got this American guy and his uh, Scandinavian girlfriend, and they're talking about the Kellogg's Muesli. And she's talking about the yummy raisins, and it's plump, and it's kispy, and he thinks it's like really cute. We should uh, fast forward like six months into that relationship. They'll be arguing and fighting. You should be going, what about the Kellogg's Muesli? You'd be fucked at Kellogg's Muesli. Shame on the lip your armpits, will ya? And there's another one, uh, you got this guy on a donkey going down the, um, the Grand Canyon. And he turns to his wife and he goes, I'm worried about my diarrhea. <laughs> I think, you're worried about it. What about the poor fucking donkey? <laughs> and then you got this woman, I mean, in America, like, everyone can be bored, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter who you are. Like, you got. Say a great singer like Aaron Neville, okay? And you know, he's made some great albums, got a great voice, very soulful. And then he turned on the TV the one day and he's fucking singing about cotton. <laughs> Attach the feel of like cotton. And you know what I mean? It's like, fucking hell. You really must love that cotton to write a fucking song about it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and there's another one where this woman stands up and says, use my mother's tampon, no way. Now, I'm a man, I know that, and I don't understand a lot about women, but I know you should never use another person's tampon. <laughs> but, uh, let's see what else I got. I got the... Uh, I didn't come prepared. I'm just trying to think of the stuff that's like, you know, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to do the nice stuff, I want to do the nasty stuff. Yeah, there's, um, have you seen this, uh, you got cable television? Kids, you've probably seen the uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network. Have you seen this thing? The fuck is it? Is it the Hair Club for Christians? Is that responsible? And it's a show that has that guy, I think, uh, Benny Hinn on it. Have you seen it, the evangelist preacher? One of these guys who pulls the hair out of his ears and fucking swoops it over his head. So, um, he's the one who like, thinks he can heal people by hitting them, you know? Have you seen this guy? He's like, you no longer have hemorrhoids when you fucking hit someone. So I was watching the Trinity Broadcasting Network and I was fucking enjoying it as well. 
I like that old woman on there. The one who looks like Dolly Parton when she's 100. And uh, they said coming up next is Benny Hinn. Uh, and I thought they said uh, Benny Hill. I thought it was going to be some, you know, saucy British comedy. Turns out the only two things that Benny Hinn and Benny Hill have in common is they both enjoy slapping old people on the head. <laughs> but, um, so I say, I'm from England and um, I'm sure some of us can uh, associate with this joke. This guy comes to me in a bar and he said to me, uh, so it's true then that all English guys like dressing up in women's clothes. I said, how dare you say that? And I hitched up my skirt, chased him out of the bar. All right, the last joke's coming up. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to enjoy reading uh, comic books. I loved reading about uh, superheroes until um, I discovered women. And it was the first and only time I went to my father for advice. I said, uh, Dad, I'm going on my first date, what should I do? He said, well, it's important to look presentable, so wear your best suit. So there I was at 7.30 outside the cinema, waiting for my first date, dressed as fucking Spider-Man. Well, that's it, folks. Yeah, all right. Here you go. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much. This ends our second of comedy on the edge, but stick around because there is going to be more. Thank you. A little more.
I was shown some very warm hospitality by the new owner's pet frog, Fluffy. some very sad news to announce this afternoon. At 11.57 a.m. this morning, the Pillsbury Doughboy passed away. According to a spokesperson for Duncan Hines Memorial Hospital, he died of yeast infection. Earlier this year, the company I work for hired the lovely Cappuccino sisters, Katerina and Natalia. Them, fine workers and America's foremost country and western karaoke duo. Or so they claimed! I knew something was wrong when I walked past the ladies' room and heard two voices in pristine harmony singing Stand By Your Agency. So I ran to the broom closet where I discovered a microwave radio transmitter and a receipt from a Motel 6 in Langley, Virginia. At that very moment, I realized the shocking truth. The Cappuccino sisters were government operatives. <gasps> I confronted them with my suspicions. Katerina remained silent. Kind of like this audience. Natalia issued a formal denial. Oh no, I'm not a government operative. No, 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 no. I'm not a government operative. No. 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 more than just another temptress, more than some Microsoft Manahari. She was a super astro vixen. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh. So I did what any loyal American would do. Stone. So of course he purchased the film rights, and I'm very happy to announce that production is set to begin shortly on the movie. Casting for the role of Phil Berliner has been narrowed down to two candidates, Beverly Hills 90210 star Jason Priestley and Sparky the Wonder Horse. And you want to know a secret? Shh, don't tell anybody. And 
now. When the eagle was young, it would make a noise like this. As it grew older, in its difficult adolescence, it would make a noise like this. Finally, when it grew to young cartoon manhood, this is the noise it would make. Thank you, Phil Berlin. to ever appear on this stage. Me, no. His name? I'm not gonna like humiliate him by like prefacing it with all sorts of encomiums which he does not deserve or desire. But he's the greatest fucking guy. Uh, his name is Steve Iskowitz. Backhand compliment or a forehanded insult? You decide. Or forehanded. Well, before I start, I have to tune myself. I just got a guitar, and I'm not really into the idea of tuning things, so I have to tune myself. Wait a minute, that string's off. Okay, it's like instead of like low strings and high strings, you have to look like low things and high things. Oh well. I think I'm tuned a little better. Actually, I'm exhausted now. When I was in college, Carl Sagan was my professor, and I wrote a theory, and I wrote a paper explaining how the idea was that there's one simple theory that can explain all astronomical, astrological, and all other types of concepts. It was one simple theory. I can't remember, I didn't know what it was, but I just wrote a paper explaining that there has to be one. And he said, there are billions and billions of holes in your theory. Billions and billions of holes. I just made that up on the right bus over here. So anyway, uh, Francis made a joke about, uh, I'm starting to get sick, I think I have to leave. But before I leave, I have to um, do my joke that you did about uh, the junkie, what was it? Junkie gum. Junkie gum, no. Was, uh, well, anyway, I was thinking of the junkie lighting company. Also, like, pothead security. Uh, don't worry about it, man. Just take it easy. Everything's cool. Oh, well, that's about it. Anyway, what are you getting sick, Steve? I've been ill all week, this way. Well, a typically monumental set by none other than Steve Iskowitz. Hey, another country heard from. Oh, is that the equipment you have to move out? Okay. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Well, join in. Come on along and join the party. Come on along and have some fun. We're going to have, we have, I love that Casper cartoon thing. Do you guys remember that? We have lots of friendly people. And we know you're like everyone, so come on everybody to the new Casper cartoon show. I love that part where he went, show. Wow, hey, you guys are pretty strong. Thanks. <laughs> what a compliment, huh? Hey, you cavemen are pretty brutal. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, you guys actually play that thing? Yeah. Cool. Well, sometime. Who wants to go first? Dan? Sure. Well then. A man who it's always a pleasure and a privilege to introduce. He's not, that's, that's, that's a real compliment. It's a pleasure to introduce him. Uh, is he part of the Baby Boomer 1, 1946 to 1951? 
Baby Boomer 2, 1952 to 1956. Baby Boomer 2, not Baby Boomer 3 from 1956 to 1961, or Baby Boomer 4 from 1961 to 1966. But he's, he's the young, old Baby Boomer, but a unique and distinct individual in his own right. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to introduce him and to have him here, Mr. Dan Savage. Francis now? Okay. <clears throat> That's not working. You gotta turn the sound up. Turn the sound up. <laughs> oh my god, it's going all the time. <laughs> I'm killing! <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Bring your own applause. Um, this room. <clears throat> This room is kind of unique. It's uh, I, I, I like to call it comedy with garlic. This is what I think of as I'm sitting here. Um, fashion things, tie-dye shirts, platform shoes, bell-bottom jeans. They say it's a fashion comeback. I say it's an acid flashback. It's really it took some really powerful shit about 25 years ago. I'm a baby boomer too, and it's just kicking in now. Cool. Um, got it. The set list together, so I have no idea where I can put this. Um, okay, here's something I saw. I saw a sign referring to the NAACP. This is in the category of politically correct things. Uh, it's the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Isn't that a politically incorrect term to use now? Wouldn't the correct term, if they fixed it, be National Association of African Americans, and the acronym would be N-A-A-A-A, -A -A -A, <laughs> pronounced nah. Hello, sir, I'm calling to raise money for the National Association of African Americans. Would you like to donate? Nah. Uh, her press release, uh, the Children's Television Workshop announced that Bert and Ernie are not gay. I'm not making this up. There was a press release. Bert and Ernie are not gay. Was this a problem? Were people worried about this? I have no idea. I understand other cast members in Sesame Street are quite upset about this. I caught the end of a press release from Kermit the Frog. It said, and in conclusion, I'm green, I'm gay, and I'm proud of it. Thank you. I always wanted to say that I never had a, uh, I never had a setup for it. So a truck that said guaranteed overnight delivery and the initials are G-O-D. God. Guaranteed overnight delivery. Don't you think that if he was in the business of shipping things, he'd deliver a little faster than overnight? So <laughs> it's a franchise, it's a laid back thing. Um, Cat fires in California, Malibu, houses burning, movie stars, kind of awful, but isn't there a little part of us, in all of us, that says, <laughs> those movie stars are getting their houses burned down? Gee, that's terrible. I know, this, that, that happens to me. And my thought is, isn't, don't you think this is God's way of saying, this is what you get for making the Poseidon Adventure Part 2? I'm a patient God, but I have my limits. You started circulating the script for Part 3, that's it. Fire and brimstone. Yeah. Sean Penn's house burned down, and it's good that they know that it was natural causes, because if they suspected arson, boy, they'd have to round up like uh, 25,000 suspects. Uh, where else are we going? Beavis and Butthead is in the news, too, talking about fire. There's a logical, little, little logic here, if I could only keep it together. The, you know, you guys know about this? Beavis and Butthead uh, had a subject with fire, and then some child set his house on fire because... Beavis and Butthead were like, uh, cool man, fire, yeah. So they take all references to fire out of Beavis and Butthead. Am I the only one who has a problem with this? I mean, you know, what if that, it didn't work that way when I was a kid. You know, what would Three Stooges be? You know, da 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 Hey, Mo, hey, Larry, what do you think? Da 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 You know, they'd have to outlaw eye poking. You know, they'd have laws against carrying lumber, you know? <laughs> they wouldn't allow saws anymore, you know? What Roadrunner cartoons, they have, you know, Roadrunner with the coyote, you know, always pee -pee -psh. They'd outlaw anvils in Utah. Right? <laughs> There'd be an outbreak of anvils landing on tourist cars. <laughs> of course, you don't have to worry if you were driving a car from the Acme Car Company, right? Right. Yeah. 
and, and the wrap up on this is, uh, I want to wrap this up with, uh, this is a very, I think this is a strange country, a strange time when we are so concerned with things like outlawing anvils, but we can't outlaw semi-automatic weapons. You know? I, I, I have a problem with this. I swear, I will come up with a punchline that will make that work. It's just a thought at this point. Semi-automatic anvils. Yeah. Yeah, only automatic weapons from the, An uh, the Acme Automatic Weapon Company. Um, do you guys, uh, any, I guess you guys are somewhat computer literate. I, I'm thinking about a joke targeted specifically towards the computer uh, crowd. That's what I do with my day job. Um, thinking about like the tough programmer, you know, the guy who's been doing it for a long time, you know, and he's talking to the young novice programmer. He says, what? Great point. Why? When I was learning how to program, we didn't have no mice. We didn't have no keyboards. We didn't have CRTs. No, we didn't have paper tape, no punches. Ah, oh, no, we didn't program with switches. We had wires, just bare wires, okay? We just crossed the wires and uncrossed them. You'd cut your fingers up. Well, the fastest coder I knew, his name was Stumpy. He was phenomenal. Yeah. We didn't even have hexadecimal back then. We didn't have oxal. We didn't even have binary. We had unary, all zeros. Nothing but zeros. For 10 years we were coding, nothing worked, nothing worked. Then Larry, he came up with throwing a one in there occasionally. We went to binary, all of a sudden everything worked. It was amazing. Okay. Um. <laughs> Superheroes, my son reads a lot of comic books and I'm learning that things like, of course, all right, that's all right. It's the super, whoa, things are happening here. I, I'm having another flashback, it's cool. Superman died, he's come back to life. Batman is in a wheelchair. Uh, Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four is dead. They want to kill off Captain America. I could just see my, my grand I, I could see my grandfather saying, these are superheroes. These are not superheroes. They're dying all over, they get sick. They have complexes, they have arguments with their wife. This is not superheroes, it's fatalism and tights is what it is. I always wanted to say fagels and tights, I'm just, just looking for this. I gotta work on the setup here. Um, okay, this is this is really this is hardly hardly forming. It's just an impression I got. Hillary with the health plan, she gets really did, did you guys catch the thing where she's getting angry now? She's starting to get really angry and come back. The angry Hillary is out, she's fighting mad, she's coming back. And I'm hearing her and I'm thinking, you know, there's something here. This is reminiscent. Let's see. This is going to be good for you. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to pay for it. This is for the good of everybody. The doctors won't make as much money. Yeah, we'll take some of their possessions away. We'll put them in communal things. Maybe we'll concentrate them in camps all together. They can shave their heads. You need a personal care number? Sure. If you don't have a card, we'll engrave it on your wrist. Am I the only one who's getting this feeling about this? They told me when I was, I was working on this joke and a friend of mine said, don't use the word Hitler in there. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get it across without using the terrible H word. That I think there's something between Hillary and... Um, let's see. There's something else I want to talk about. Uh, my father, the eardrops there. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do the eardrops. Okay. But I think the thing that we do as parents is we try to make the world better for our kids. We try to improve things for them. Like my father, my father talking to me, he'd say things like, uh, my, my, father, my father would beat me with a belt. You know, I'd never use a belt. I'm going to use my hands. Come here, kid. I'd go running from, you know, just great. What did your grandfather use, Dad? A brick? You know, it's a big improvement here. I'd go running for cover and my mother would run would would block, would defend for me. She'd say, Jackie, stop! Don't hit him in the head. Don't hit him in the head. Thanks, Bob. Like the rest of the body is wide open, but we've got to save that head, you know? Those broken ribs are easy to fix, but the dental work, so expensive, so costly, goes on forever. Yeah. Of course, you know, you think about it, the closest thing to Dad's swinging hands would be Dan's head, you know? We're here at the Savage Beatings. The kid is taking a pummeling. It's unbelievable. The score so far is Dad's hands three, Dan's head zero. <laughs> we're flying around here. But sometimes I think a little fear might be a good thing. Just a little fear might be a good thing. I'm the enlightened dad. I don't even raise my voice to my kids much. Nonetheless, 
hit them. And my kids, they aren't afraid of me at all. And it's awful frustrating sometimes. And my daughter had an earache, and we were in a rush to go somewhere. And I said, well, honey, here's what we'll do. We'll, uh, you get dressed, and we'll put the eardrops in in the car. Okay? And she said, no, you put the eardrops in my ear, and then I'll get dressed. Honey, we're really in a rush. We're running tight here. So you get dressed, and then we'll put the eardrops on in the car. OK, sweetheart? I said, OK. We'll put the eardrops in first, and then I'll get dressed. So I'm going to put a fucking brick in your ear. Oh my god, what did I say? I, I, I can't believe what I said to her. She's in the corner. What is she doing? She's, she's laughing at me? Why is she laughing at me? Why are you laughing, sweetheart? Oh, that's so funny, Dad. You couldn't put a, you couldn't put a brick in my ear. <laughs> yeah, you ought to talk to your great-grandfather about that one. And so we compromised. I put the drops in her ears, and then she got dressed. So, uh, uh, all right, that's the new stuff. And uh, what can I? What? What are you waving about? What are you waving about? Yeah. yeah? What's that? What? The old stuff? No old stuff? Can you want me to talk about you a little more? No. 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 What? I know she wants to get this. So uh, I'll tell you how, uh, did, did Sam, this is how she describes sex to me, all right? This is how she explains sex to me. She said a man and a woman get together to make a baby because a woman has like one egg and a man has like a gazillion germ cells. I like that explanation. Yeah, right. Stay away from all those boys that have got way too many germs. She's always been crazy about Barbie and Barbie this and Barbie that. She told me when she grows up she wants to look just like Barbie, except she'll have nipples. And a boyfriend, complete with penis. This is every father's dream. So, I'll turn you back to Mr. Francis, or whoever he's going by, the, the anti-hero. The wrong hero. The wrong hero. <laughs> Let me try out some stuff. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> <gasps> oh, sit. Sit over after this. Well, um, well, our next guest, fine, distinguished comedian, or comic, or funny person, or humorist, or I forget that big fancy word that S.J. Perlman used to describe what he did, or something like, through the lot towards uh, writer of amusing fables, Louise Goldstein. Yay. You know, I wake up each morning with joy. And if my husband finds out, I'm dead, absolutely dead. It's my new job. We're rocking today, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. So um, I had this feeling that my husband was cheating on me. And um, I turned on the Discovery Channel, and I found out who he was cheating with. Another new joke. Yes, I'm testing new jokes. Yes, test, test. Just a test. I work um, for a nonprofit organization. Um, what that means basically is that I have a not now account at the bank. My money loses interest. I used to work for the Dissociated Press, and um, it was really a great place to work. But the uh, ink was separate from the paper. The living section was composed of DNA that would actually breathe and move. These are new jobs. I don't know how they're going to go. It's brand new, never tested, till now. Um, what else can I tell you? I used to work in nursing. I used to work in nursing, but my breast got much too sore, so I had to get out of there. Just had to change. Had to change. I have a great sex life. I'm married. I have a great sex life. One night, my husband's on top, then me, then my husband, then me, then my husband, then me. We love our bunk beds. Love them. 
he tried different positions, you know, like his hand grazes my breast as he reaches for the remote control. I told him I wanted steamy romance, and now we sleep with the vaporizer on every night, you know? Not what I had in mind. Good tip for you, good tip for you. If you get nervous, get nervous, try breathing through your diaphragm, but make sure you clean it first. Just a tip. Well, I've been looking at my family tree, and uh, what it is basically is a weeping willow. <laughs> yes, it's depressing. Um, my great, 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 great grandfather, Cy Goldstein, was president of the Hair Shirt Club for men. You know, um, my ancestors, they fought against the enemy in the deserts of Palestine. They used kosher spears. As years went on, they evolved. They used gilt edge swords, finally honing the ultimate. Hope you feel better, sir. Uh, feel better. Drink your chicken soup. I have to catch my bus. Catch your bus? No, don't let my leaving be. Oh, no, no. On your bus. This is what the universe wanted. It's fine. Um, <laughs> go ahead. So, um, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. You can laugh. That's the point. Laugh, laugh. You're supposed to laugh. That's what we're all here for. Laugh. Have fun. Enjoy. So, when I was young, we used to go on these vacations. They were, um, oh, my father was so cheap. He was so cheap when I was a kid. He wouldn't even use Greyhound bus lines. We had to use mud. <laughs> you know, I it's it was awful. And um, at home, he was cheap at home too. Like we had a pay phone in the house, no incoming calls. You know, it just I had to wear generic clothing. Like if I had a dress on, it was white with dress and capital black letters across the front. You know, nobody would spring for any frills in my house. Just, uh, just terrible. Just terrible. So what else do I want to tell you? Here at Comedy on the Edge. Comedy on the Edge. You're on the edge of your seats. Um, my father was generous in some ways, I'll tell you that. He gave to charity. He gave to charity. And she in turn promised not to tell about their affair. So, and my mother got him back. She had her affair catered. Got him back. Well, I'm gonna leave now and um, Remember, keep the faith. Yeah. My father did, and it cost him a fortune. Back to your host. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elise Goldstein. <laughs> I look up on the wrong side of half the bed today. <laughs> Is it my imagination or uh, are rock bands becoming more like comic books every day? You know, Maybe the other way around. could be, you know. It's like, Guitar Man, yeah, yeah, that's it. There we go. I got five strings of justice. Um, I don't know. I got a bone to pick with you. Um, bluegrass Man, get out of here with that bluegrass music. Ah, I can't stand it no more. I'll do any music. Uh, uh, yeah, my father was a hippie. And he taught me a lesson I never remember. In fact, a lesson he'd never remember either. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, okay, back, back, you teeming crowds. Uh, who shall it be? Well, okay. Isn't it funny how, you know, whenever there's somebody who's younger than you, Imagine if like, someone were like, uh, say, 35 years old and you were 36 and you started talking to him like this. Well, and how are you today? Oh, I'm so mighty glad to see you. Boy, I think you were nutty, huh? Well, anyway, so, you, but you, make the, you can make the opposite mistake. You, know, you can say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to him like I've talked to anybody. Well, how are you today? Well, come on up here. Come on. Give him a laugh. Give him. No, but I'm not going to do either of that. Instead, uh, I'm going to lose my 
my voice. Um, I'd like to introduce Sam Savage. Sam Savage.
cards, and only three cards, and see if you can move the whole thing around. Um, one. Okay, you want me to pick a card? This one. Okay, now look at it. Show the other one. I'll turn it around. What card is it? Do you know what the card is? Yeah, I know what it is. I thought maybe I'd show you crazy Hitler pumpkin here. Um, 
I will wipe out the inferior vegetables. Um, people say I'm out of my gourd, but well, anyway, I don't know. See how you make this work. <laughs> Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Wrong movie. I, th I thought I was in uh, the night be Nightmare Before Christmas or something. Well, I'd like to thank all of our guests today. The absent Steve Iskowitz, um, Sam Savage, um, Willie Savage, who was the helper for Sam. Your napkin? Oh, okay. You know, they always say, end on a laugh. This would save comedians a lot of trouble if they had this. What happened? Wait a minute. Turn it down for just a second, okay? Right, one more time. Well, it ain't the barking dogs, but until we get them, that'll have to do. Thank you for viewing Comedy on the Edge, and we'll be back with another one very soon. In fact, right after this is Hi! Shh! Don't be shy!